Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, thanks very much, and um, thanks for inviting me to do this uh, interesting way of giving a uh, conference speech. I've never been on the giving side of this, so if I'm staring down, it's probably because I'm looking at my notes. I'll try to stare at the green dot at the top of my iMac. <laughs> I don't know how successful I'm going to be in doing that. So uh, just bear with me. But anyway, thanks again for uh, inviting me, and uh, glad to be with you here to speak about the topic of trust, and particularly trust in voting systems. Um, I think it's a misunderstood concept, um, especially in voting systems, but also in computational systems. So I'm going to try to clear it up from the perspective that I'm coming from, which is uh, from a voting integrity and computer science background. Um, if you want to read more about um, my work and writings on transparency and trust, just go to my website at www.notablesoftwarealloneword.com and then there's some boxes about the security watch columns that I used to give and one of them was on transparency and trust, not specifically on voting systems, but also um, many, many papers and articles on voting systems uh, in the e-voting section um, that you can access, download, etc., etc. So um, you're welcome to uh, read out more about it. And um, those of you who want to uh, write to me afterwards or communicate with me afterwards, contact information is on the website as well. So here's the problem. Um, when we're dealing with trust in the computational context, we're dealing with it as a methodology as well as a descriptor. So in a descriptor, we're looking at it as, do we trust this system, you know, just sort of a generic understanding of what, you know, saying that we trust something. So you've all seen this um, type of thing that pops up on a screen where it says trust E. I'm assuming that many of you, have you ever seen that little icon that says trust E on a web page? Some of you should nod in the affirmative, so I'm getting some feedback. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. That's good. And how about the lock? icon, you know, the little lock, sometimes you see that on Windows. Does any of that make you feel, you know, inspired to trust that website any more than you would any other website? Yes, no, I don't know. Yeah, no, it doesn't, you know, I don't think that these things, anybody could put this on a web page um, just because it comes from Microsoft. Um, what does it mean, you know? Why, why does, would this inspire trust? In addition to that, we do have a trusted computer development methodology, uh, which used to be called TSEC, T-C-S-E-C, -E and that was replaced a few years ago by the Common Criteria, I guess now about a decade or so ago. Um, these were, were maintained by the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technologies, as well as some international standards groups. The first, the TSEC system, trusted systems, was a development method that was developed as a result of the law, the U.S. law, the U.S. Computer Security Act of 1987. I'm going to read to you. It was intended for application to sensitive information whose loss, misuse, or unauthorized access to or modification of which could adversely affect the national interest or the conduct of federal programs or the privacy to which individuals are entitled. So this was primarily intending for um, federal agencies such as IRS, you know, these types of, you know, and also military applications as well. Um, so all of this was intended for that. But you would think, given the wording one I just read, that that would apply to voting systems as well, affect the national interest for the conduct of federal programs. So you would think it would be applied to voting systems. But as it turns out, the U.S. Congress exempted themselves from this act. And since the Congress actually oversees the federal election, then they exempted themselves from having to require this for voting systems. So a nice loophole for them. And so no systems, no systems ever, no voting systems ever have been constructed under either the TSAC or the common criteria specifications. And those are the those are sort of the the best of the art, the state of the art of what we have in terms of computer security types of development methodologies. Um, so it's rather remiss that we're not seeing that being applied. We've never seen it be applied. We talked about it in the IEEE Standards Committee, tried to develop a common criteria standard, but there was so much arguing and yelling it never actually got developed. So, so we still don't see anything like that. So as it turns out, voting systems are not required to be developed under the trusted systems method. Not only that, 
the certification that we have, such that it is, is actually under a method that's called the Voluntary Voting Systems Guidelines because of states' rights. The federal government cannot enforce any particular methodology or certification criteria on the states. Now, the states can voluntarily say, all right, we want to use this criteria that you created for us, um, and then they can adopt it on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, some of them have, so it was about two-thirds, I think, the last time I checked. Um, but the other third, they either do their own thing or they come up with their own ad hoc. So those states have sort of accepted it, like in California, they have their own um, criteria as well that are applied. But basically, the criteria are far weaker, all these criteria, even these voluntary voting system guidelines, far weaker than required for any other government projects. And most importantly, the idea of correctness is very use loosely defined. So what is a correct ballot or a correct voting system, or even in terms of counting every vote or making sure that voting systems stay functional during the entire election, very loosely defined in these voluntary voting system guidelines. So even if the state did adopt those, what is correct still is a matter of interpretation. So we have this, this problem as far as trusting our voting systems. And so a number of people have been starting to say, well, what if we made them more transparent? Right now, the voting systems primarily are sold under trade secrecy. And so it is actually illegal to go into them and open them up and check them out, even if a voting problem has actually occurred. The only way you can get permission to do that is either by a court order, or if you want to just hack into them, you know, go ahead. But <laughs> you could get into trouble as a result of that, as some folks at Princeton University found in other places. Like um, in India, there was a, a recent hack there of voting systems, and a researcher was, was uh, arrested. So depending on what country you're living in, checking out the inside of voting system to see whether it's working properly could wind up being a bad thing for yourself. So the question is, what if we have open systems or open source? We talk a lot about that, you know, Linux, Unix, open source types of things. People have a tendency to think of them as more reliable and better in a way because many more eyes are looking at them and that they're vetted. So is that an appropriate thing um, as opposed to what we're referring to as security by obscurity? In other words, protecting it by saying, well, you can't look at it. If you look at it, it'll tell you how to the election and so we won't let you look at it. It doesn't necessarily prevent anybody from looking at it, but we don't we don't look at it. So the open idea is, is along the lines of the open kimono business method. The more we reveal to you, the more you should trust us. If you see us naked, you know, you should trust us. <laughs> I don't know if that works. And actually I don't believe that either of these works. Open source, open systems is not equivalent to trust. Just because you can see something that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be able to trust it. And so for an example, we have the perfect example that happened just in the last uh, month or so. Um, there's a group called Open Source Digital Voting that was working under another group or together with this other larger group called Trust the Vote. And they had been working for the last couple of years with the Washington DC Board of Elections and Ethics Project to create a internet voting project where you yeah, have internet voting, but it would be open source and the feeling was that if we had this be open source, it would be a safer system to be able to use. So the idea was, created the system, these folks, they put it up on a special server to you know, allow people to hack it and uh, do their penetration attacks. And within 36 hours, the whole thing was hacked to the extent that when you press the cast the vote button, the University of Michigan fight song played. So, <laughs> so, so you may have heard of, you know, that this actually happened. So not only that, they harvested passwords as well as the public key used to encrypt the ballots. So there was also intrusion attempts um, noted from China and Iran. So, so this is, you would think that this uh, basically indicated that this was a dismal failure. Um, there were many, many problems. There was testimony, uh, you know, I think there was even a congressional hearing, and uh, folks testified as to what happened with regard to this. So I was on their website, the DC Board of Elections website, a couple of days ago. I was actually looking to um, take down the comments that they had said about the fact that they were suspending after the 
this hack uh, was noted that they were suspending the use of this until further notice. Lo and behold, I realized after the election, actually, this was a few days ago, that in fact, they actually went ahead and used the system. So it, although it was proven to be hacked, and it was totally open and transparent that this was hackable, and in fact it was hacked, not only really well by people in the United States, but also around the world, they used it anyway. So what does this mean? What, you know, you can have as much transparency as you want, but that does the transparency really correspond to trust? And in open source voting, we have a number of problems. One of them is you have insufficient time to test. So if the testing is going on, the usually it's going to occur a couple of weeks before the election, which may not be enough time to, in this case, to revise things, fix them, make sure the problems go away. So you have insufficient time to test, you have insufficient time to correct, to correct, and you never know when you're using open source in these types of scenarios, you don't know which version is actually running. Was it the corrected version? They have no way of withdrawing it. It's open source. We made it as free software. They're, you know, the people in the OSDV Trust the Vote project were lauding the fact that DC owned this and they could do whatever they wanted with it. Well, they used it, and that was really bad. So, so these types of hacking exercises using open source, and I'm not saying open source in and of itself is bad. I, I like open source. I think it's great. There's a different concepts of open source and free software, and, you know, these types of things. And, and that's great. But is it great for elections? And my feeling is that these hacking exercises, although they demonstrate a great number of things, if these are going to be misinterpreted as testing by the by the vendors or even by the people who are intending to use this, if it's interpreted as testing, oh, we tested the system. Well, you tested it and it failed. You should not be using it. So you're providing more damage than you are good by doing this hacking. I'm not saying that we shouldn't you know, have such tests. But what I'm saying is that those tests don't provide us with the trust that we need. There are certain intractable problems in computer science that I identified in my uh, doctoral dissertation I wrote about 10 years ago. In fact, I defended it 11 days before the 2000 election. So before anybody was really concerned about this problem, I was working on it. And I discovered that there were these numerous intractable problems, such as checking ballot layouts, testing key press combinations, examining code for correctness, like I'm talking about with open source, and protection from denial of service attacks. And you can read those. My whole thesis is downloadable off of the website. The problem is that we have this enigma in voting, in that full anonymity, if we have a fully anonymous system, which we want to cast our ballots anonymously, it's not compatible with full auditability. So we can never have a totally anonymous system that we can audit properly in computer science context to make sure that the system actually was operating correctly. You need to have some sort of, you can't be in, I'm sorry, what I, what I mean to say is it's full, full anonymity is not compatible with full auditability in a totally electronic voting system. You need to have some form of tangible mechanism that you can also examine in order to do the audit. So, so you, you cannot do this in a paperless voting system. It's mutually incompatible, and it requires some design trade-offs. So again, that was the subject of my thesis, and you read more about that. A lot of people since 2000, and especially since 2002, after the Help America Vote Act um, was enacted in the United States, started thinking of other different types of voting uh, methods. And a lot of one of the many types of methods that have been coming out were cryptographic proposals. Now, as I mentioned in this you know, prime example, well, if the cryptographic key can be harvested off the internet, then a cryptographic proposal is not going to be any more secure than a, than a non-cryptographic method. So we know with cryptography, there's end-to-end -end problems where there's risks at the end. Um, cryptography is not equivalent to trust. Cryptography is not transparent. How transparent can it be? It, things are encrypted and we have to trust that the encryption algorithm was correct and that there wasn't other things going on when the ballot was encrypted. And then also, for trusting a voting system, do you have to have a PhD to understand the voting method? If it's cryptographic, how are you going to be able to understand it? So I think we're looking in the wrong direction. My feeling has been all along with regard to transparency and trust issues is that we need to assess risk and then mitigate risk. And if you're just looking at trust and transparency and you're 
not also looking at risk, then you're, you're missing the forest for the trees. So the questions that I have is, first of all, is it possible to have a secure internet voting system? No, it's not. There's too much risk. We know that the internet is not secure. There's no way to mitigate it. So I don't believe that it's an appropriate application for voting. No matter how you do it, whether it's open source or however you do it, it's just not going to work. Internet voting is too risky. So then the question is, is it possible to just have a secure open source voting system running maybe on standalone machines? That question, I don't know if we've answered that yet. Possibly. I don't believe that open source precludes security. Some of the vendors and even the Federal Election Commission have been saying that if we had open source, then we can't have a secure system. I don't necessarily believe that. But I also don't believe that open source doesn't provide security. So the voting system still needs to be paper-based. You still have to have the auditability factor, and you still need to have other assurances of security design just beyond the openness of the source code. So these, the openness is not sufficient. So you need to go further than that, and the design and assessing the risk is also a part of that. So my conclusion is that transparency is a component of trust, but it doesn't necessarily provide trust. So I'll repeat that again. So that's the that's the sense you have to take away from the, from this talk. Transparency is a component of trust, but it does not necessarily provide trust. All of the transparency in the world will not compensate for poor design and inappropriate applications. So that's basically what I have to say today. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Does anyone have any questions? So uh, how how worried should we be? How how worried should we be about this precious right of voting that my father fought for, that uh, is now subject to uh, criminality? How worried should we be about that? I believe we should be very worried about it. I think that things have gone um, pretty bad in the last uh, decade. We had, for a while, we were going really into the fully electronic, but that trend seems to have been stemmed. But basically what we have is most of our votes are now counted electronically, and nearly none of those votes are ever audited. So even these paper-based systems, you have optically scanned, you know, various different types of, of paper-based systems, um, even the ones that are attached to the computers, if you never look at the paper, it's not going to give you any sense of trust in the voting system at all. And basically that's what's happened. Florida, in fact, although they, get, they went toward the um, electronic system shortly after the 2000 election, for the 2002, it was such a failure, had so many problems in the gubernatorial race in 2002 that they decided to abandon that and go back to using paper but they actually made it illegal to go and check the paper. Any recounts that occur have to be from the electronic totals. I actually testified in an election in uh, Orange County, California, where that very issue came up. In California, they have a law that says that the paper ballot should be the ones that should be used to provide a recount in case that there's any problem uh, with the election or if there's an election contest. But actually what in fact happened was that there was an older law in California that was never revoked. And it said that the person contesting had the right to use the count in the original method, in other words, the method that was used at the night of the election, or in a different method. In other words, by either rescanning the ballots or um, by hand counting them. The judge ruled in Orange County, now again, this was a local judge, this was a county judge, so it was not a statewide ruling, uh, but it, it could provide some precedent. The judge ruled that since they wanted to have it counted not by hand, but actually by rescanning um, the ballots or using it electronically, they said, well, you know, that's that was their choice. And in fact, that particular methodology of doing that um, gave the, the win to the, to the individual who, who chose that method. So what's the point of having all these voter verified paper ballots if we're never going to count them and our laws and our judicial system is going to rule against counting them when we have the opportunity to do so. So yeah, I think we should be very worried. I'm very concerned about it. Rebecca, I have a question for you. Can you describe where you are right now? I'm very curious. <laughs> <laughs> where I am? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in my office at Notable Software. It just looks 
rather strange because we've got this bizarre design on the wall. We <laughs> have some sort of hippie to be at wall. <laughs> 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 so, yes, yeah, so I'm in my office in, in New Jersey, in Hamilton, New Jersey, at the forensic laboratory of notable software. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, are you going to watch us on live stream for the rest of the session? Yeah, I'm going to watch it very exciting and um, you know keep up the good work. Uh, it was a nice opportunity to speak for you folks and I'm glad it worked out well for us. Thanks so much. Uh, it's nice being there but very nice to uh, speak for you. <laughs> <laughs>